The United States Supreme Court was the subject of a conversation we recorded with Paul A. Freund, professor of law at Harvard University and a distinguished scholar of the court. Professor Freund's essays on the court have been published under the title The Supreme Court of the United States, and he is the author of Freund on Law and Justice and Other Legal Studies. His thoughtful, well-reasoned answers to questions we raised gave us his view of the value of the Supreme Court and its place in our system of government. We began by asking Professor Freund to tell us what the various functions of the court are. The Supreme Court has a number of significant roles. Some of them are more conspicuous than others. The controversial function of the Supreme Court is that known as judicial review, by which we mean the review of the validity of legislation or the validity of executive action, whether taken by federal or state organs. Uh, interestingly enough, the Constitution is silent on the subject. This has led some students to conclude that judicial review, beginning with Chief Justice Marshall in the early days of the 19th century, was a usurpation. I think it's clear, however, that it was not a usurpation. It was an authority that was meant to be conferred by implication. I say this because the Federal Constitutional Convention rejected proposals to give a veto power on legislation to a council of revision composed of judges and members of the national legislature on the ground that if the laws violated the Constitution, they would be so declared invalid in the ordinary course of the judicial function. It was not necessary to have judges associated with others as a council of revision. I think, in other words, the debates in the Constitutional Convention suggest more clearly than the silence of the document that the review of the validity of a law, if it came up in the course of an actual lawsuit, was meant to be part of the ordinary function of judges. Was judicial review, as it came to be practiced here, unique to the United States? The doctrine of judicial review was uh, carried to unique lengths in the United States. Of course, England uh, did not have this form of judicial review, except over the colonies. And the European systems uh, did not have this form of judicial review. The government, that is, the parliament and the executive, could not be checked by the courts. They might be checked by public opinion or each other, but not by the judges on any ground that they violated the supreme law. The predominance of judges under this doctrine of judicial review, isn't this undemocratic? This is a matter largely, I believe, of uh, semantics. Uh, it has been said that judicial review is the least democratic part of our governmental system. In one sense, that's true, obviously. It is the least controlled by uh, the popular will. The judges, at least uh, the federal judges, uh, are not elected. They hold office for life. For practical purposes, they can't be removed, though they could be impeached. But that is only one aspect of democracy, the majority will. In that sense, the court is an undemocratic institution. It may set itself over against the popular will. But in another sense, democracy, at any rate constitutional democracy, implies the protection of minorities and limits on power. In this aspect, the Supreme Court is not anti-democratic, but is an essential part of a constitutional democracy. It is uh, preeminently the arbiter of the exercise of power by governments, whether vis-a-vis -vis other units of government in the system or vis-a-vis -vis the citizen. Justice Holmes said that the country would not come to an end if the court lost its power to declare an act of Congress void. He went on to say, that he thought the Union would be imperiled if the court lost that power with regard to acts of the states. The reason, I think, was this. 
that in dealing with Congress, we are dealing with a body in which the states are themselves represented, and therefore an inner political check on federal authority exists as a built-in element. On the other hand, the federal government is not represented in the state legislatures, and consequently, the potentiality of state laws reaching beyond their proper limits, interfering with the federal system, producing conflicts, is a very real one. And in a federal union, as Holmes suggested, an arbiter is especially necessary in order to see that the proper jurisdictional bounds are kept on the part of the separate states. What other major functions of the court come to mind? Beyond that, the court has an important function in maintaining the uniform application of federal law. We all know how burgeoning federal law has been, and it would be intolerable if a federal law like the Federal Pure Food Law or the Interstate Commerce Act or the Communications Act were to be given different interpretations in different courts in different parts of the country. We need a single tribunal at the head of the courts as a final arbiter. That function is performed by the Supreme Court. It is the arbiter of suits between states, and thus within the American Union we are spared the predicament of states in the international community of having to go to war or resort to diplomacy for the settlement of disputes, boundary disputes, for example, disputes over the allocation of interstate waters, disputes over pollution of water or air from one state to another, are all taken before the Supreme Court of the United States. It is, as has been said, a substitute for diplomacy and war. We have a picture of the justices of the Supreme Court armed with the power of judicial review, the Constitution before them as a guide. And yet, from an historian's point of view, it would seem that the court addresses its power to different ends at different times. As, for instance, the modern court's particular concern with questions of civil rights and civil liberties. It's true that historically there have been tides in the affairs of the Supreme Court and the country. In the early era, the Union was cemented through the aid of the Supreme Court under Marshall. After the Civil War, the burgeoning of business was stimulated by Supreme Court decisions. That took a rather dim view of certain regulatory laws, indeed struck down the federal income tax. In the more modern period, the notion of equality and of fair procedure and openness of the society has become dominant. I don't think any of these is wrong. All these concerns are in some degree legitimate. They're all concerns embodied in the Constitution. The problem is one of emphasis, and it's not surprising that certain themes from the Constitution should be dominant at one period and certain themes at another. I've sometimes compared the interpretation of the Constitution with the interpretation of a great work of literature, like Hamlet. To one generation, it is simply a story of revenge. Uh, to another generation, it may be a study in the conflict between spectral evidence and rational uh, methods of proof. Uh, to another generation, it may be a study in mother fixation. To another, it may be a study in the borderland of insanity. Now, none of these interpretations is wrong. They all derive from the play, and this diversity is what makes the play a work for the ages. The interpretation, I think, is a response to the concerns, the needs, the aspirations, the ideals, if you will, of the generation. The same thing is true of a work meant to endure, as Marshall said, for ages to come, the Constitution of the United States, which has in it many themes which cannot all be of equal primacy at any given time. And it's not surprising 
that at certain periods of our history, the national aims, aspirations, concerns, needs, uh, point toward those themes of national unity that are in the Constitution, and at other times, they point to themes of equality and fair procedure that are also in the Constitution. Are there then times when the court clearly shifts away from some particular area of concern, and perhaps into new areas, and possibly even new ways of seeing the Constitution? The evolution of constitutional doctrine is usually achieved over a period of time. What you have is a kind of moving consensus. You have a few voices at first, uh, perhaps in dissent, then gathering strength, and then they become the center, and finally the battle moves on, uh, that ground has been taken, and uh, the frontiers involve new advances in uh, strengthening the position. This is uh, not a bad procedure, but uh, there is the problem of not getting too far out beyond public tolerance. The court must not just mirror the sentiment of the day. After all, the standards laid down in the Constitution were meant in, so far as they are part of the Bill of Rights, as checks on popular majorities. One also has to add, I think, that the Supreme Court decisions themselves are a creative force in molding public opinion. That is to say, public opinion is not something to be weighed independently. The Supreme Court and public opinion are in reciprocal relation. The Supreme Court not only reflects, but also to some extent molds public opinion. I've sometimes said the court does not follow the weather of the day. On the other hand, it necessarily follows the climate of the age. I think the judges uh, are like scientists in this respect. Uh, they are ahead of the general level of understanding of their time, but they have to work in a context of time. It's unrealistic to have expected the atom to have been discovered in 1800 rather than in the 20th century. And it's no accident that many scientific discoveries occur simultaneously around the globe. And I think the same is true of law. Ideas have their time. The climate of the age is important. And if the climate of the age is one of extending the egalitarian principle, as I think it's clear the climate of our age is, it's not surprising that the court, not necessarily consciously attuned to this sentiment of the age, but a product of its own education and uh, environment, that the court itself will emphasize the egalitarian guarantees in the Constitution. But to go very far beyond, shall I say, the highest standards of the time uh, would threaten uh, the acceptance of the court, and acceptance of the court is, in the end, what the court has to depend on for its authority. The court does not have a militia at its disposal. The court does not control the purse strings. The court, in the end, depends upon acceptance. It depends upon constitutional morality. That is to say, a general consensus that the decisions of the highest court will be respected unless and until they are changed by constitutional amendment or overruling. No lawyer would agree with every uh, decision made by the court, but the fact is that the reasons are given, the dissenting reasons are given, the matter is laid open to the judgment of the country, constitutional amendment is possible, and successors on the court, or even the same court, can be asked uh, to reconsider. As Justice Brandeis said more than once, uh, the court always yields to the lessons of experience and of better reasoning. With all due respect to Justice Brandeis, 
Have there indeed been times when the court has not yielded to such lessons as quickly as some might have hoped? If you go back to the Dred Scott case, just a few years before the Civil War, where the court declared that Negroes who were descendants of slaves could not become citizens and that Congress could not abolish slavery in the territories, the court was uh, clearly out of step with the climate of the age. Of course, it was not out of step with the view of the slaveocracy, but in terms of the dominant and the ongoing sentiment of the national community, it's fair to say that the court was out of step, and this was certainly indicated by the reaction which the decision drew and by the fact that it was, as Justice Hughes put it, one of the self-inflicted wounds of the Supreme Court. Similarly, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the 1920s and early 1930s, the Supreme Court, by its vetoes on measures like price control laws, minimum wage laws, and the like, was out of touch with the climate of the age. Certainly those decisions were applauded by certain segments uh, of the population, but it's fair to say that the more perceptive thinkers and uh, those uh, more in tune with the wave of uh, sentiment uh, recognized that those decisions could not endure. They produced the constitutional crisis of 1937 and the president's court packing plan and uh, a shift of direction by the Supreme Court. But that was a case where the majority of the judges, it seems to me, found themselves out of step, indeed out of comprehension of the direction in which national concerns and ideals were moving. That predicament of the court, that position of trying to put into law the dominant ideas of an earlier generation is one that is not calculated uh, to endure, and when it occurs, the court is running into trouble. Do you feel, as some people do, that in the matter of its decisions relating to the rights of accused persons, the court is way out of step with the climate of opinion? The court is certainly uh, in conflict with a very strong segment of public opinion. With specific respect to the criminal law decisions, I think it's only fair to say that the Supreme Court has rendered a number of decisions favorable to the prosecution. We ought not to forget that. If it is objected that arrested persons are given too many privileges by way of right to counsel and the like, one should also remember that the Supreme Court has upheld the use of informers by the prosecution over the objection of some civil liberties groups. The court has upheld the use of blood tests and police lineups over the objection of some civil libertarians that these violate the privilege against self-incrimination. The court has not been as unbalanced in its attitude toward criminal law enforcement as some of its critics would make out. What the court has been trying to do, I take it, uh, is to encourage every effort by the police to use objective, scientific, if you will, methods of detecting crime, but to turn very square corners in attempting to prove the commission of a crime out of the mouth of an accused person. After all, the privilege against self-incrimination has roots in the Bible, and this is not something that uh, was dreamed up by the court. What is there to guide the justices as they consider their decisions, particularly in situations where they are called upon to make a judgment which is likely to be controversial, even unacceptable to many Americans? The judges have, with virtual unanimity, professed what they call a canon of self-restraint. That is to say that they will not decide a constitutional question unless it's absolutely necessary to the outcome of the case. They will resort to other grounds of decision uh, if they can, and that in most areas, at least, a uh, great weight is to be given to the legislative judgment. However, in practice, there has been considerable difference. 
Some judges have been characterized as activists and others as more devoted followers of self-restraint, but none of the judges has ventured to assert the power to give advisory opinions outside the framework of litigation. There has been a difference, however, in the degree with which they follow the canon of self-restraint. This shows itself sometimes in what they regard as a political question. The reapportionment cases are a good example of that division. The group on the court, led by Justice Frankfurter, uh, regarded the subject as one not appropriate for the judges uh, to decide. Uh, they regarded it as, in a very technical sense, a political question. On the other hand, a majority of the court uh, took the view that the courts ought properly to consider the question and enter a decree. How do you see the future of what you have called judicial self-restraint? There's no question but what the court has been more active in recent years in areas that previously were thought to be non-judicial areas. And I would suppose this momentum would carry forward. It's conceivable that this momentum uh, would carry over into new fields, such, for example, as that of uh, the executive power, where in the past the court has had very little occasion to make decisions. It's conceivable that with the concentration of power in the presidency, a court might enter a new terrain and review acts of the president. Nevertheless, there are certain fields where I think one can say that the courts will not enter. Certain uh, areas of foreign affairs, for instance, whether we are right in continuing to recognize the old regime in China, or whether a conflict is a legal war, seem to me to be questions that the court is still uh, likely to regard as political in the technical sense. What do you feel is the role of criticism of the court? And what is its appropriate and proper limitation? And what function can it play that is constructive? Criticism of the court is an important element in, I believe, the evolution of the law. But one has to differentiate criticism that's informed and of goodwill uh, with criticism that takes the form of personal abuse and emotional outbursts. Certainly, uh, criticism is needed to help the court in the process of that continuing openness to re-examination that's one of the glories of the institution. The criticism can be both professional criticism from lawyers in their own journals, law teachers in the classroom and lectures, and a criticism in the popular press. That's all to the good. What is really hurtful to the court as an indispensable institution for a law-ordered society is criticism that refuses to comprehend the role of the court, the integrity of the court, the difficulty of reaching a judgment on borderline frontier issues. There is a great disservice done, I think, in treating decisions as if they were the uncontrolled expression of the predilections of particular judges. This has its result in cynicism and indifference to law, disobedience to law. What legitimate criticism do you think there might be of today's court? Well, I think the more informed criticism of today's court does not question the direction in which the court has been moving, but rather uh, the pace at which it has been moving, and perhaps the lengths to which it has carried uh, some of its basic doctrines. If one can be irreverent for a moment, it may be like the little boy who said he could spell banana but didn't know when to stop. This, I think, is what uh, some critics feel about the Supreme Court. As far as the basic direction goes, the court is sometimes criticized as being really no different from the court of the 1920s and early 1930s in too freely exercising the veto over 
legislation. This court has upset electoral districting systems, it has upset police practices, and so on, and it is argued that this is essentially the same as what the court in the 1920s did when it upset price laws, minimum wage laws, production control laws, and so on. That the court in each instance was simply trying to put into law its own notions of what on the whole was right and preferable, rather than applying the mandates of the Constitution, those spacious mandates like equal protection of the laws and due process of law. I think this ought to be said. The comparison strikes me as less than perfect for this reason. The older court was striking down laws that were the product of a legislative governmental process, prices, wages, and so on. The present court, by and large, is concerned with the procedures by which government formulates its laws. For example, the reapportionment cases and cases dealing with freedom of assembly, freedom of protest, freedom of speech, and the like, may seem on the surface to have very little connection between them, but they both relate to the process of representative government. They both relate to keeping the political process clean and clear and responsive, whether through properly allocated representation or through keeping the channels of public debate expression and dissent open. That is a rather different thing from undertaking to decide whether the product of the political process is on the whole wise, unwise, too harsh, or whatever. The court may be said to have a special responsibility to see that the political channels are properly working. We are talking now about broad issues before the court and the nation, and yet, the court always deals, does it not, with specific cases, with lawsuits between real persons with real problems. There is a certain paradox here. We say the role of the Supreme Court is not like that of an ordinary court. It is not just to decide whether John Doe or Richard Rowe should prevail. Its special function is to clarify and advance the law in terms of principle. And yet we don't allow the court, or the court doesn't allow itself, to announce principles divorced from the John Doe, Richard Rowe kind of lawsuit. But I don't think there's any basic contradiction here. Justice Holmes used to say the art is to see the general in the particular. Uh, one can study the flower in the crannied wall, root and branch and all, and learn what God and man is. In a more humble way, I think this is what the courts, and the Supreme Court in particular, have to do, they have to discern the large principles in the context of that particular flower in the crannied wall. You don't feel that it would be wise for the court to speak out on matters of law whenever the time seemed right to the justices? I feel very strongly that it would be a mistake uh, to give advisory opinions. That is to say, make decisions outside the context of actual bona fide lawsuits. I say this because much of the strength of the Supreme Court's work derives from the fact that its decisions are based on the context of actual facts, not abstract questions. And advisory opinions, which are divorced from the concrete realities of specific facts, tend to produce abstract and, it seems to me, unsatisfying results. For example, if it were asked whether the National Defense Education Act is constitutional in authorizing grants to parochial schools for certain purposes, I think a really safe result would require that we know more of the specific facts of the case. What is the grant being used for? How uh, sectarian is the so-called parochial school, and how has it worked? In, in general, the results will be much more viable if they are grounded in concrete particulars. 
advisory opinions tend to stimulate abstract decisions such as a wall of separation between church and state, uh, which are not uh, satisfactory guides for the conduct of affairs in real life. When the court does deal with a case that turns on a great constitutional issue, often the justices themselves are divided. Sometimes the vote is close, and not infrequently there is a dissenting opinion which, well, which quite frankly challenges the judgment of the court. Isn't this a source of confusion and uncertainty to many Americans? You're perfectly right, I believe, on that. Uh, but I think people are becoming more sophisticated about this than they used to be. As we see uncertainty in the highest reaches of other disciplines that have been thought to be fixed and authoritative, like science, it's a small wonder that in the higher reaches the frontiers, where after all the Supreme Court is working, uh, there should be similar divergence and room for difference in the law. Uh, scientists uh, equally honest and capable dealing with the same data uh, differ on whether the universe is uh, expanding or is uh, in a steady state. And so constitutional lawyers and judges dealing with the Constitution differ in weighing the values, shall we say, of uh, internal security on the one hand and human dignity and privacy on the other. How these things are to be weighed is not prescribed in the Constitution. The Constitution gives power to enforce criminal laws. It also provides for the right to be free of coerced confessions uh, and other guarantees. Now, how should these be weighed when they are in collision? Judgments will differ on this depending upon the relative premium put on one or another, depending also on different estimates of what is required in the name of efficiency as against a personal immunity. Either we accept, for at least for the time and place, the decisions of the tribunal making these decisions, or we revert to a, a kind of anarchy in which there is no supreme law, uh, but whoever has the stronger will and the stronger force prevails. We've opted for a rule of law, which means uh, a rule of law as interpreted. It's uh, a little bit like Churchill's uh, remark on democracy. It's the worst form of government except for any other that's ever been thought of. Uh, we could, like some European countries, make a practice of announcing every decision as a solid, a unanimous decision. But that seems to me ill-advised, uh, both from the point of view of the predictability of law and from the point of view of its uh, susceptibility to change. Dissenting opinions are, as Chief Justice Hughes once phrased it, an appeal to the brooding spirit of the law. They are a recognition that the law is never closed on itself. It is open-ended. The wisdom, if it be wisdom, of a dissenting opinion is there to make its appeal to those who come after. Sometimes those who come after uh, will not be impressed. On the other hand, many of our great advances in constitutional doctrine have owed much to the force of dissenting opinions of men like Justices Holmes and Brandeis and Stone. I think that the strength of our constitutional order depends in large measure on the court being open to self-criticism and indeed self-reversal. Of course, a court which uh, constantly overrules itself uh, is likely to be in trouble but the abuse of uh, a practice is no argument against the value of the practice. We've had very important overrulings throughout our history. The Legal Tender Acts, which financed the Civil War, were held unconstitutional. And then, uh, within a couple of years, uh, that decision was overturned. Similarly, the Supreme Court had held Congress was without power to forbid child-made goods to be transported in interstate commerce. After a number of years, uh, that decision was overruled. 
It would be unfortunate, I think, if every ill-advised decision of the Supreme Court had to be corrected by constitutional amendment. You would clutter up the Constitution with a lot of very specific, substantive provisions that really don't belong in the Constitution and are better attended to by uh, appeals to the self-corrective process of the court. Professor Freund, in the most general way, would you comment on the ultimate value of the court to the nation? The court, in a sense, uh, is the conscience of the country, but within limits. After all, uh, the court has great power, but very little responsibility for government. The court can say nay, uh, but uh, the court cannot institute programs, it cannot make appropriations, it cannot make appointments, cannot pass laws. It would be too easy and uh, certainly a matter of popular rejection if the court, without responsibility, uh, did purport to exercise power that ought to be exercised by those with the responsibility. At the same time, the court is an important source of our moral awareness and moral standards. When we think of individual rights of expression, we think of uh, important statements by Justice Holmes, Justice Brandeis, Chief Justice Hughes, uh, not to name the living. They were all judges. We bracket them with Thomas Jefferson, who was not a judge. But certainly, in modern times, the memorable expressions and symbols of the moral claims of dissent have been the utterances of Supreme Court justices in the context of cases. The court is a symbol in other ways. It's a symbol of a society where the supreme appeal is to law. It's a symbol of an open society in that access to the courts is available. You don't have to organize a lobby to get a hearing before a court. It's a symbol of rational discourse. The adversary system assures a hearing to both sides. It's a symbol of openness in that the court's decisions are articulated and open to discussion, criticism, re-examination. In all these ways, it's a very important symbol, it seems to me, for a society which regards itself as a rational, humane, law-abiding community. Thank you, Professor Freund, for your appreciative and thoughtful comments on the Supreme Court of the United States. We have seen that the court is central to our democratic system of government and to the expression and the maintenance of those standards, legal and moral, which we value and upon which we have built American society. The court, both in change and in continuity, in every generation brings to bear upon the pressing concerns of the time, the inspiration and the weight of our constitutional tradition. And in so doing, it keeps us true to the goals of those who brought this great nation into being nearly 200 years ago.